When I was 14, 15 years old, I was refereeing, and uh, while I was refereeing a match, someone thought it would be a funny rib uh, to piss in my gear bag. And that night and the next day, like, it just kept going in my mind. Like, is this even worth it? This is stupid. But for some reason, whatever it was in me, I decided to show up to my show that Sunday. Yep. So 2012 was a weird year. I had my first ever professional wrestling match on May 6th, 2012, and I thought it was going to be a one and done for me. And uh, shortly after, in July, I decided to continue wrestling. And for an entire year, I guess, or more or less, I refed and wrestled. And I was bullied a lot because I didn't have a great physique. I was very soft looking, very pale, hand-me-down gear. Everything was hand-me-down. Uh, Mike Bennett gave me my first pair of long custom tights, technically custom tights, and my first pair of wrestling boots. And I heard a lot of, you should, you should have just stuck to being a ref or, wow, oh, Mr. Big Shot over here is now a wrestler. Or I was even told once that I used my ref pull to get wrestling bookings. And it, it was just absurd. It was absurd to me, uh, especially at like 18 years old. Um, I got into wrestling when I was 13. It's all I ever wanted to do, regardless if I was just a ring crew guy, a janitor, ring announcer, referee, or what I am today. I just knew I wanted some involvement. Um, breaking the fourth wall, the guy behind this camera right now literally said, you should have quit. Like the way I was treated, I should have hated it so much, hazed, bullied, whatever you want to call it. Uh, probably shouldn't be around at this point. I don't know if it's uh, stupidity or if I just love wrestling that much and I, I've just always wanted to be a part of it. And I never gave up. And the way that I was treated, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure I've hazed somebody or made a bad joke that upset them, but I feel I took what was given to me and tried to make it a positive. To this day, I try to help everyone I can, uh, just whether it's just hopping in a car, I don't care about gas money, or wrestling someone's first match. I get something, I get a fulfillment uh, out, of, out of doing that. For me, the first ever Limitless show, I was booked last minute and it was just an indie show in Maine. And for me, that did not mean anything whatsoever. Until I got there and I realized it was a different crew, a different crowd for the most part, and it was a different person behind the scenes trying to put on the best possible event he could under the circumstances of trying to run a first ever event. From there, it was clearly noticeable what he was trying to do. He was trying to build a brand. He was trying to build a company around his guys Regardless if those are the same guys that are on top now or not, you could tell who he was trying to push and who he was trying to make better. The first few years of Limitless, it was a show every other month. Every couple of months, there was a brand new Limitless event. And to go from there to 
sellouts of 350, 400 people every other month in Westbrook was huge. And finally believing in himself enough and just saying, all right, if we're going to do it, what do we have to do next? All right, we're going to run monthly and continuing to run monthly in an even newer area, a little further north, and being able to draw 350 people there in Yarmouth. I feel like it just shows what kind of guy Randy is. And I truly believe just from talking to him and becoming friends with him that no matter how successful he becomes, enough is never enough. And I think that's the kind of mentality you need to have in this industry or you just become complacent. I think I've tried every single possible thing to get looked at or to to gain a connection with a crowd, whether it was my first silly wrestling name of Josiah Matthews, to AG Saint, to the Revolution Anthony Green, to All Good Anthony Green, which ended up being my, my namesake for years until I realized what what was All Good Anthony Green? What was the big man on canvas frat boy character? It, it wasn't me. It was what I thought I needed to be as a professional wrestler. And I built it up so much in my head that I have the nice gear. I'm paying this money for the photos. I look great. I have the social media presence. So I think uh, it's... It's a lot to think about as an independent wrestler. We are not contracted anywhere. There isn't a person above me telling me, this is how you need to speak, this is how you need to dress. We are our own costume designer, our own writer, our own PR person, our own social media person. We have to do everything ourselves and you see guys that are so successful at it and I thought to myself, what, what do I need to do? And in 2017, it, I came to the conclusion like, I'm going to be a local yokel for the rest of my career. I'm going to wrestle in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, maybe Maine. I don't know, but I wasn't going to be anything past that. And luckily, I had a support system, uh, a lot of really good friends that believed in what I wanted to do, regardless if they even liked it or, or liked the character. They liked me enough and they believed in me enough that this mustache wasn't that stupid. The sideburns weren't that dumb. Me wanting to wear generic Zubas and a, and a stupid satin jacket wouldn't hurt me too much. Even my own trainer told me this character could make you a lot of money, but you're never going to be a main event guy. Westbrook, it's going to be you and me for the very last time inside a steel cage. The biggest main event and probably the biggest flub. Um, who would have thought that Ace Romero would be a two-time viral video star, one for a really cool pounce and two for a cage, literally falling apart and landing on top of us. We had a steel cage match last show. It fucking broke. We almost fucking annihilated a row of people. We we're almost done. That was fuck everything at that point. Uh, I think it's a, uh, a real big point that we come back strong tonight, guys, because uh, I'm sure a lot of people were uh, a little skeptical to come back to wrestling after that, after they almost died. Uh, luckily, D.L. <laughs> Hurst, uh, with a broken fucking leg, caught the cage. In the moment, I was furious because you got so much going on in your head on what's going to happen, what we're going to do in the cage, and it built up, and the crowd was on fire for the main event, and then that happens, and you just feel the energy of the entire like building get sucked, and everything's gone, and it's quiet, because now it's like, are they hurt? Is this match still happening? Who knows? We somehow brought it into the ring, and... In the moment, I didn't think it was cool, but all the fans just started like leaning up against the cage, and I was like, okay, they're holding the cage up so we can have this main event. They don't want this match to be ruined. And we continued the match, and it went off how it went off. I don't think it was the best main event in Limitless Wrestling history, but 
I think the moments is what actually mattered. And I think what we gave them and, and just the whole feel of it, the aura was much more important than anything we could have done, any move we could have hit. I could have jumped off the top of the cage and hit the craziest move you've ever seen, and it wouldn't have mattered because what mattered was the energy of the crowd when they decided we're not going to let this ruin our main event. I want to first start this by saying thank you. Uh, it's not only the Limitless Wrestling fans, but Limitless Wrestling as a whole. Uh, you guys were the launching pad for the retrosexual Anthony Green. And uh, the reason why I asked for this time is because I have something that I've needed to get off my chest. For those of you that know, in March, I had probably the craziest seven-day span of most wrestlers in their entire career. Uh, one day, I lost my opportunity at becoming the Limitless Wrestling World Champion. And one week later, Evolve Wrestling just kind of fell in my lap. Um, since then, I have signed with Evolve Wrestling. And as though you know, uh, there will be conflicts when it comes to dates. And with that being said, I have to say that I can no longer be just a wrestler at Limitless Wrestling. Because I have to be the champion. You think I want my Vacation Land Cup legacy to be the biggest blunder in Limitless Wrestling history? No, no, no. I'm going to be in the Vacation Land Cup. I'm going to win the Vacation Land Cup. And then, I'm going to become the Limitless Wrestling World Champion. See you soon, Max. The VLC was a real weird day for me because I wanted to go in. I knew I was wrestling Sean Spears and Tommy Dreamer, and then if I beat them, I go to the finals, the Fatal 4-Way, to become the VLC champion. And everyone else was like, save it for tomorrow. Like, tomorrow's the big day. Don't do it today. And I just was not having it. Like, that's my crowd. Uh, I've said it, I think, before. I've told Randy 100,000 times that South Portland, uh, the South Portland Club is my place. Like, that's my building. My favorite building of all Limitless Wrestling history. And I was not going to half-ass it in front of 350, 400 people, regardless of what I had going on the next day. He is the leader of the Fanny Pack, Retro AG.
2019 Vacation Land Cup winner. Tommy Dreamer, Sean Spears, JT Dunn, Kevin Blackwood, Ace Romero, the best of the best. MJF, I showed you I love Limitless Wrestling. You, you're somewhere in Jacksonville cutting promos, and I'm here, standing in front of you, the VLC winner. Anniversary, four years of Limitless Wrestling, Retro Anthony Green will be the Limitless World Champion. Here we go. <clears throat> Ooh, baby, do you know what that's worth? Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. They say in heaven, love comes first. We'll make heaven a place on earth. Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. When the night falls, down I'll wait for you and you come around and the world's alive with the sound of kids on the street outside when you walk into the room you pull me close and we start to move and we're spinning with the stars above and you lift me up in a wave of love ooh baby do you know what that's worth ooh heaven is a place on earth you see in heaven love comes first we'll make heaven a place on earth Ooh, heaven is a place on earth yeah see voice of an angel i can show you all like i have like pictures and like the ticket stubs to this day still where's it so, at I'll, oh let me find it real fast it won't take that long because i know where everything is yankee pro wrestling shout out let me find these uh, ticket stubs real fast. There it is. USWF. First ever. It was 97. Jeez. May 10th, 97. That's me and Pierre the Mountie right there. That's not the real Mountie. That's Pierre the Mountie. What else we got here? Got some cool stuff. I know for a fact there's a picture of me and a warlord somewhere. Look at that, me in three minute warning. K Quick Autograph, Killer Kowalski. One of those is Juventud Guerrero. Guerrero, rather. Man, I'm such a cute kid. Uh, this was a roller coaster of emotions, to be honest. I got a random call on a Thursday from Gabe, and he said, I have a meeting for you. Canyon Seaman on Monday, are you free at 4.30? And even if I wasn't free, I was going to be. Um, and I was just told it was an interview and didn't mention that there was gonna be any sort of talking about money or if there was a contract on the line or anything. I really thought it was just gonna be him seeing where I'm at. And that Monday came around and just, I've never been nervous for a phone call. And I remember I hopped in my car uh, it was the quietest place I could find. And he called me and he just asked me about my life. Asked me what I do for work, what's my living situation. And finally, he basically said, we're interested. And this is the deal, this is what we can offer. And if you can make this work, then we're gonna try to move forward with this. And it could have been 20 bucks a week. Like, it didn't matter. WWE is the dream and I had to say yes. I had to say yes. 100%. And then he told me it just had to be okayed. A week goes by, I hear nothing. A couple more days, nothing. And finally, I woke up to the most important text of my entire life, where I was told it was approved and I was going to begin the hiring process to work for WWE NXT. And uh, not knowing what the future of me as wrestling wise on the independence, I thought it was gonna be very important for me to be here this weekend and have my closure, as you guys are saying, and make sure I wrestled 
you know, two, three, four matches that were important to me that I knew would mean something to the people that I stepped in the ring with. Independent wrestling and specifically Limitless Wrestling, I've stepped foot in the ring with the absolute best. I've been in the ring with Ray Phoenix. I've been in the ring with A.R. Fox. I've been in the ring with Paul London. But there's one name that's in the back of my head that is my favorite match. Not just my favorite match, but the best match in Limitless Wrestling in 2018. And that was with Ashley Vox. And it's, it's no uh, secret what's been going on in the world. And who knows what the state of independent wrestling is going to be in two months or what it's going to be in a year. So I was given the opportunity to face anybody, anybody I wanted for the Limitless Wrestling title. So who better than the only person to ever beat me in South Portland? The real catch, Ashley Vox. <laughs> September 2019, at the Limitless Wrestling Anniversary Show, I won this title, I walked through the curtain, and I told you exactly what I was going to do. I was going to represent as the Limitless Wrestling World Champion. I was going to take this belt everywhere I go, and I did. I brought it to Jersey. I brought it to Zero One USA Northeast. I've defended it everywhere I could. I even brought it to the dojo. I'm one of the few Limitless Wrestling mainstays that has walked in the dojo, showed up, and showed out every single time, and I'm always putting this on the line. Ashley, come here. Ashley, come here. She wasn't here when I said this earlier one-on-one. -on -one. Ashley, you are the best professional wrestling match I've ever had to this day. You're still new in comparison to a lot of people, but you are fucking incredible. I'm not bullshitting you right now. I'm not cutting some wrestling promo. I'm telling you from the heart, you are absolutely incredible and you still show up because I know you want this. You've gone to NWA. You've always just not had an ego about you. You've done so much in pro wrestling and you've always stayed you. That's why people like you, people like me, this is why we represent Limitless Wrestling. I just want you to know that I love you. Come here. You are incredible. <laughs> that, that's as real as it gets like she's amazing and I'm just glad that for whatever happens next if this was the last time you and I ever get to wrestle for whether it's pandemic reasons or whatever I'm glad we got to do it one more time I'm just come here. thank you Ash <laughs> is a non-title singles match scheduled for one fall. One fall! Introducing first, standing to my left, fighting out of Death Valley, California, by way of parts unknown, the Ava Taker, Ava Everett! <laughs> and her opponent, fighting out of Danger Town, USA, the current reigning, defending, limitless wrestling, heavyweight champion, Retro AG, Anthony Green! This is, uh, this has been real, I don't know, it's been real weird. It's been real emotional for me for a bunch of reasons. Um, mainly for the fact that something I've loved all my life, uh, that I worked very hard to do was taken away from me for a lot of, a lot of months. And, um, when this came up again, 
uh, and not knowing what the future of independent wrestling is at all, uh, I asked Randy if I could specifically choose each of my opponents and uh, what you just saw was me versus my girlfriend, my real life girlfriend, uh, the Ava Taker, Ava Everett. And uh, the reason why I chose her, a ton of reasons. She works incredibly hard. Um, I love the story that five months into her wrestling career, probably less than 15 matches, her and I wrestled in both of our first ever Limitless Wrestling dojo style matches against one another as like a couple versus couple. And it was very cute, it was very fun with high intensity in between. And this match was totally different. A year and a half uh, later, I guess it is now, and she is leaps and bounds above what she was then. And she'll never give herself the credit. And Openly, I don't give her enough credit for a ton of things. Um, man, I met her in 2017 when I was still all good, Anthony Green, before the retro AG truly came out to party. And uh, I was on the verge of being done. I was going to be a local yokel. I probably wouldn't be standing in front of you today on a Limitless Wrestling show. And uh, she believed in me every step of the way. She believed in the mustache. She believed in the character. She would drive hours with me just to keep me company. Uh, she is sometimes an enabler uh, for the wrong reasons. But uh, if I found out that this was my last weekend of ever being able to wrestle on an independent show, or if I wasn't going to wrestle in front of a live crowd for another six months to a year, I told Randy I needed to wrestle uh, Evie the Ava Taker, Ava Everett, uh, one more time, and I'm just glad we got to do it again. If this year is the end of your time in Limitless Wrestling, I would just like you to take a walk back on um, what this has been, like what this has been to you. Um, Five years? Yeah. It's, uh, it's been real cool. Um, I think Randy, even every other place I've ever wrestled uh, on the Indies, I think Randy's the first person to give me, like, a real chance and, like, put me in there with the right people. I think my third show that I was on, I was the main event, and I got to get the pin, and it was just, like, a huge moment for me, and my, uh, my big undefeated streak happened all by accident, and that turned into something else. Um, every wacky idea I ever gave him, he thought about it. Uh, he's the first guy to throw me in there and really challenge me with guys like Phoenix and Fox, who I always knew deep down I could hang with, but I don't think any other super indie was going to give me that opportunity. Same with Paul London, Ethan Page. I can name every other guy that, that he's thrown me in the ring with. Um... And then when it came to changing the character, going from all good to retro, he will be the most blunt person with me. And he said, I think it's stupid. I don't think it's going to work. And then he's the first person that will say, you know what? I was wrong. I think this is a great idea. It took a few months, but he, he gave me the ball. He let me roll with it. He let me do what I thought I needed to be the biggest heel I could with the company and continued to push me. And even when I was the, you know, match four comedy match with Colt Cabana, I always, I, I never worried about it. I never worried about wins and losses because I knew uh, Randy and Limitless always had the, the best for me. And I thought, and I always told him, I don't work as hard anywhere else because I feel like no one else gives me the time or gives me the opportunity. And uh, I remember when he was talking about the title, it was never a question of if AG is going to be the champ. It's going to be when is AG going to be the champion. And he's just always, just always uh, pushed me to my limit and made sure that I was the best version of me and I always uh, look forward to his last minute uh, pep talks before I go through the curtain uh, gives me a huge hug every time and just tells me to fucking kill it and uh, 
definitely gonna miss that. And uh, I'm just gonna miss all the people that have uh, become really close friends, including him. I'm not gonna be able to see him as much, obviously, but uh, I know he's gonna be around. He's always gonna tell me what he thinks sucks or what he thinks is uh, good. And uh, I'm just glad that Limitless has took me in and uh, I'm not just a guy on the roster. I, uh, I really think I'm like a family member here. <laughs> into wrestling when I was 13. It's all he ever wanted to do. Regardless if I was just a ring crew guy, a janitor, ring announcer, referee, or what I am today, I just knew I wanted some involvement. 